Go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 2. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles uh, in front of you, it's page 832. So Christmas has come and gone. It lasts for a little while, and then just like that, it's done. Um, We have a word for that. That's why we call it a Christmas season, right? We know seasons come and go, and in Chicago with the weather, we experience them all four of those seasons, the weather seasons, uh, pretty regularly, like today. But Christmas season, uh, my son this past week, Carson, as we were leaving our Christmas Day celebration, said, man, Christmas goes by fast. And I'm sure you've heard your kids say that as well. Maybe you thought that too. With the end of the season comes a time to put away the reminders of the season as well. So maybe you're like our family. Basically, Christmas is over. We start taking down the decorations. Maybe you're appalled by that. I don't know. Uh, But we started taking lights down. Ornaments are stored away. Wreaths put away. Tree is dragged outside. And for some, the Christmas music stopping is the worst part of everything, right? Because you've been listening since October. But it can be downright depressing to have the Christmas season end. They say about a quarter of Americans say they experience some symptoms of depression when Christmas is over. But here, what many of us will do and many around the country, what many of us are tempted to do, what many around the country will do, is they will not only put away the physical reminders of the season, but they will also pack up the hope and the joy and the peace and the promise and the fulfillment of Christmas. Because not only are they putting away physical reminders, they're putting away the very reason we gather and celebrate. They're putting away the person for whom we celebrate this season. But when Jesus is put away, what we're going to see this morning is salvation is put away. When Jesus is only synonymous with the season, then we enjoy him for a time. We enjoy him for a time. Because baby Jesus is cute. Baby Jesus is an easy story to tell our kids. Baby Jesus is safe and doesn't call us to account for anything. He doesn't challenge us. He's personal. We can hold him in our hands. I heard uh, one story of a guy who was in a Starbucks in December and people all around him were singing Joy to the World because it was playing on the, the speaker. And he said, what do you think would happen if in the summer in Christ Alone played in the coffee shop on the speaker? Would people be singing along? But you see, joy to the world is one that many people know and will sing along with because it's part of the season. But this baby is different. We just sang and come that long expected Jesus a few things about this baby, that he has come to set people free from sin and fear. He is the comfort and hope of all, a king who will reign forever, eternal, ruling over our hearts from his throne. So maybe this week, as you were opening gifts, you were reminded that sometimes the best and most unexpected things come in the smallest packages. And that's what we have at Christmas as salvation is wrapped up in a baby. So here's what faces us this morning. Many of us are here, and we've celebrated Christmas. We've spent money on gifts. We've reflected a lot. We've sung a lot of songs. We've attended services, read the Christmas story, and maybe you were here on Christmas Eve or another church on Christmas Eve with family and friends. But what does all of that matter? Because it's easy to celebrate a season. And yet what we will see this morning is this baby demands more than a season. He demands our whole lives. To make a decision, a choice of who we will follow. And so the main point that you'll see in your notes this morning is this. How you respond to baby Jesus matters. How you respond, how I respond to baby Jesus matters. And this is where Luke goes next in our text this morning in Luke 2. He wants to confirm the identity and purpose of this baby born in Bethlehem. We have very few accounts of Jesus after the night uh, he was born till the time he is 30-something years old, starting his public ministry. We're going to look at two of those, one this week and one next week. And so we're going to see three things in this scene today in the temple. We're going to see the anticipation of Jesus, the appointments with Jesus, and the announcement of Jesus. And as we go throughout, I'm going to kind of highlight three responses because, again, it's important that we respond to the message of Christmas and who this baby is. So first, we come to the anticipation of Jesus. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 22, and I'm going to read through the first half of uh, verse 27. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. 
He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. So let's pause there. So none of what we're going to see this morning is possible without the obedience of Joseph and Mary. These two servants of God who have taken this amazing uh, news of parenting God's own son, continually, continually faith, are faithful to God's law and what he says. So in verse 21, which we didn't read, we read that on Christmas Eve, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day and given the name Jesus, which is the name the angel told them to give him. Imagine if Mary and Joseph chose not to name him Jesus. All right? They were obedient to God's word. And three times in these verses I just read, the theme comes up of God's law. It says the law of the Lord three times. They were devout followers of God. And obedience, their obedience is what brings them to the temple in this scene. Right? Their obedience is what brings them to the temple. Jesus is 40 days old at this point, exactly when they should be coming for the purification of Mary and to consecrate Jesus as the firstborn son. So let's look at those two things real quick because we're not very familiar with them. The first, the purification of Mary. So according to Leviticus 12, a woman who gives birth to a son is ceremonially unclean for seven days, which means she can't enter the temple. And then for 33 more days after, the woman must wait to be purified from her bleeding. The start of that 33 days is also the day of circumcision. So that's where we get the 40 days that Jesus is in the temple. And in their obedience, they come and they're also supposed to offer a sacrifice. The sacrifice was made by the priest to make atonement for uh, Mary, and then she would be clean. And then we see this uh, note about the sacrifice that you were supposed to bring a lamb, and if you couldn't, there was provision made in Leviticus 12.8 that you would bring two doves or two pigeons, which is what Joseph and Mary bring. So it doesn't necessarily mean they were dirt poor. Uh, it does mean they didn't have the means to get the lamb, which was a little bit more expensive, but they are a humble family with humble means, but faithful to the Lord. And then the second thing they have to do is consecrate Jesus, right? They set him apart because according to Exodus 13, 2, which will be on the screen for you, it says, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. And this is coming uh, after the Israelites are freed from Egypt as a way to remember the Passover when God, uh, when the angel of death came in and the people would spread the blood over their doorposts and God would save their firstborn son. This is a way of, again, consecrating, setting apart their firstborns to remember God's saving them on that first Passover. And if you're with us this summer in our first Samuel series, you might even feel there's some kind of connection between Hannah when she takes Samuel and presents him. She had prayed for her son and said, he is for the service of the Lord, and she takes him to the temple. So Joseph and Mary show total commitment to God, and we're going to come back to them again a little bit later. So, but hang on to their obedience. Joseph and Mary are on their way to the temple courts, but there's something else happening, and we read that the Holy Spirit is stirring in the heart of a man named Simeon. And Simeon starts to make his way to the temple courts as well. Now, all we know about Simeon is in this passage. We don't know anything about him before or after, and we get very little information. We don't know what his vocation was. We don't know his age, although what he says coming up means he's probably a little bit older at this point. But we do get the most important information, and that is his spiritual condition. Where is his heart? And what we see is he had a soft heart. He was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel. Not many people at that time could be, could be said of them they were righteous and devout and waiting for the consolation of Israel. It had been 400 years since they heard from a prophet. But Simeon, here with these words, righteous and devout, he was a believer. He knew the promises of God, he trusted in them, and he, in faith he stood on them. And Simeon was also a poster boy for anticipation. Okay, Anticipation for the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. And you're like, well, all the, all the Israelites were looking for the promised Messiah. Yeah, but Simeon had something special that nobody else did. All right? Did you catch that, what the Holy Spirit did here? The Holy Spirit said to him, you will not die before you will see the Lord's Messiah. So here's Simeon. Now imagine the anticipation for him. Kind of like a kid at Christmas, right? How many kids keep asking, is Christmas today? All right? How many more pieces of this chocolate do I have to eat before it's Christmas? 
How much longer? And here's Simeon just waiting like, is today the day? Like Holy Spirit promised you will, you will not die. Like no matter what happens to Simeon, he's like, I'm not going to die today. I didn't see the Lord's Messiah. Right? Like he knew there was something coming and he was anticipating it. And so like nobody else before, he's anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, the promised one. And it says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And we just sang Israel's strength and consolation. But what does consolation mean? We don't use that word a lot, uh, but it means comfort. So we might say, if it's any consolation to you, if it's any comfort to you or does it, if it makes you feel better. So there's this thing in fantasy football called the consolation bracket. The consola- there's people laughing. They know where I'm going with this. So the consolation bracket, we all know, is really just the people who didn't win. They're the first losers. They just get to play in a championship, right? And so, so the consolation bracket, for some, brings that hope. Hey, I'm playing for something. Right? I'm playing for something. And um, it's very personal to me because our senior pastor and my wife were in this competition together, in this consolation championship together. And there was just this weird thing of like, they're very comforted by this championship when everybody else above them is playing for the real championship. <laughs> Let's just say it was a bad Sunday night in our home. Jackie did not come out on top. So, but anyways, going back to the consolation, because again, it does, it brings that comfort and like, hey, I'm playing for something. And so here's Simeon and he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for the comfort that is promised to the people. And so this baby is going to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 40, which you'll see on the screen. The Israelites in the exile and after the exile until Simeon were encouraged by these words. It says, comfort, comfort, consolation. My people, says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And what Simeon knew was that this ultimate comfort and consolation was coming in the Messiah for the ultimate fulfillment. What would it be like to wake up every day and say, is today the day I see the Messiah? I wonder what it'll look like. I wonder what he'll say to me. I wonder if I'll know it's him right away. And the word waiting here, he's waiting for the consolation. It's very important. It's an active word, right? It's not passive waiting. It's active. It's looking and waiting, ready to receive all that is hoped for. He's lived his life waiting for God, and instead of growing impatient and bitter, he was righteous and devout. He trusted and followed God in the unknown of the waiting. It's hard to wait, right? It's hard to wait. At least with Christmas, we have a countdown every year, right? The movies tell us we have 25 days till Christmas. Our calendars say we have 25 days till Christmas. But it's hard to wait because most of the Christian life is, when is God going to show up? When is he going to do something? When is he going to take care of this? When will he work in my life? We don't know when certain things are going to be done, and we don't know when he's going to return again. So, Will we grow bitter, impatient, or will we, like Simeon, continue to trust and to follow and wait in the unknown? But Simeon here has a soft heart. He was primed and ready to meet the Lord's Messiah when he showed up. Now imagine in that temple how many people walked past Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus that day as they're walking to the temple courts. Now maybe some people noticed them. Maybe some people smiled at them or said congratulations for the baby that they were carrying. Maybe Jesus cried and brought attention to himself in the temple courts. But only one heart was ready that day to receive the Messiah. And his response mattered. But we can't miss this. If you were reading this, you were reminded reminded three times that God does the work of preparing our hearts. Okay, God does that work. Three times in this passage here that we just read, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. We don't get the Holy Spirit a ton, right? In the, in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, we started to see him kind of come up here named as the Holy Spirit, well, first with Zechariah. And now we have this picture here of the Holy Spirit preparing Simeon. And it says the Holy Spirit was on him, the Holy Spirit revealed something to him, and the Holy Spirit moved him. And the Holy Spirit works the same way today. It works the same way today. As we're reading these words, he's doing something in your heart. Right? He's stirring. These are the words of God. But what can happen is we can hear the words and harden our hearts. We can hear the words and our hearts can be softened. The first thing we need to know before we can respond is that God is the one who does the work in our hearts. He's the one who gives us the new heart to receive him. 
So again, left to ourselves, we cannot respond in faith to an incarnation like this, a miraculous birth from a virgin. We cannot respond to a substitutionary death on the cross while all of our sins are placed on Jesus and we get his righteousness. We cannot respond on our own to a resurrection from the dead. We have to have the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. And this, again, is one reason why we know this is true, because we wouldn't believe it otherwise. But the Holy Spirit opens our hearts, softens our hearts, and we're ready to receive what he has for us. And Simeon was prepared, and hopefully we're prepared as well, for our own appointment with God. So the Holy Spirit prompts Simeon to move to the temple courts because, again, God has an appointment for him that day. He may not know why he feels the need to go. He sees Joseph and Mary and this little baby, and maybe there's some interaction. He finds out about this miraculous birth, and the Holy Spirit says, this is the one. We're not really sure how he's drawn in and how he knows, but he does. So let's pick up the story, uh, the last half of verse 27, and see this appointment that Simeon has. It says, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed." and a sword will pierce your own soul, too. So this baby led Simeon to praise God and say really the most amazing words that have been ever spoken over a baby causes Joseph and Mary to marvel because Simeon now knows this is salvation. The salvation is wrapped up in this baby. And he's content, right? He says, I can die now. Lord, you can take me. I have seen your salvation. And again, he looks past the small package of a baby to the purpose for which he came. No other baby in history, even all the miraculous births we read about in Scripture, ever was told that they are salvation. They are salvation. But Jesus here, you cannot separate Jesus from salvation. It's impossible. You cannot have one without the other. And what happens next is, I mean, that that should be mind-blowing to Joseph and Mary, but they've kind of already heard that, right? Jesus will save his people from their sins. So they know there's something about him, but they marvel, and they probably marvel at what's said next. Because it says the salvation was for two groups of people, the Israelites and the Gentiles. So let's just read the whole world. So first, Jesus is a light for revelation to the Gentiles, So Simeon is waiting for the consolation of Israel, but he also knows his Bible. He knows his scriptures, what we know is the Old Testament. And he goes and he says, well, let's connect this all the way back to Abraham. Because Abraham in Genesis 12 is told, you will be a nation, the people of Israel, and from you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So what's Simeon doing here? He's saying, well, this is it. I mean, this is what God was talking about at that point, that Jesus as the salvation is the fulfillment of that promise. But we can go even further back to Genesis 3. God is cursing the serpent, and he tells him one would come from Eve. Eve was not Jewish, right? One would come from Eve who would crush the serpent's head. That crushing of his head would result in our salvation. So here's Simeon saying, hey, the Gentiles are included in this. Second, Jesus is the glory of Israel. Now, the Jews were the ones with the promises of God, right? They, they knew that Jesus, that the Messiah was going to come from them, and they were awaiting that consolation of Israel. They knew it would be a Jewish Messiah. And even Joseph and Mary here, he will save his people from their sins. So they're thinking he's going to save Israel. But now they're told there are more people included in this. And that was the shocking part. I love how Jared Wilson summarized the scope of Jesus' work and salvation in commenting on this passage He says, Christ's work then frustrates the Gentiles' search for glory apart from the God of Israel and unravels the Jews' search for glory apart from the inclusion of the Gentiles. Let me me read that again. Christ's work then frustrates the Gentiles' search for glory apart from the God of Israel. They're not going to find it from anywhere else. It's going to come from the promised Messiah to the Israelite people and unravels the Jews' search for glory apart from the inclusion of the Gentiles. So you can't have this salvation without other people being included. So get ready, right? He is a savior for the world. 
Now, everything is good so far. I mean, we've had these amazing moments in the Christmas story, and now all these positive things, they're hearing about all these things that are going to come true in their son, and then reality sets in in verses 34 and 35. When Simeon shows that Jesus would also fulfill the prophecies of the suffering servant, the man of sorrows, we call him in Isaiah 53. The salvation wouldn't come through a rebellion or in a clear victory, in the national or military sense anyways. Instead, it would come with a cost, the cost of rejection and pain. And basically, what Simeon's doing here is he's summarizing Jesus' entire ministry. He's saying the whole time he's going to cause the falling and rising of many, revealing the nature, the true nature of people's hearts. And it leads us to our first response. The first response is to trust Jesus. Our response to the baby matters because Jesus forces a choice. He is the light for revelation of the Gentiles, the glory of Israel, but throughout the Gospels, as he's revealing people's hearts, as he is standing up and proclaiming the good news that he is, People reject and oppose, or they humbly acknowledge and submit, following him as their Savior and Lord. And Jesus knew this was what his ministry was going to be about. In Matthew 10, which we'll see on the screen, this is what he says. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's enemies will be the members of his own household. These are hard words. Especially in light of Christmas, we just sang and we read in Isaiah 9, isn't he the Prince of Peace? And he is the Prince of Peace because he is the one who reconciles us to God. He brings that peace together. But if you know anything about what you read, if, you, if you've read scripture, if you know how people responded in your own life when you've given your life to Jesus, there will be conflict in those relationships. So Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, there's going to be conflict. That's what I came to do to draw a line in the sand. Are you with me or are you against me? And he came as the turning point in history. Everything hinges in my life and yours and how you respond to him. And it's not do you celebrate Christmas or do you go to church? Do you follow Jesus? Simeon's words are coming true throughout his ministry and Paul picks up on this in 1 Corinthians 1. Let's read this together. The Jews demand signs and Greeks or Gentiles look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. We're going to preach the same message, Christ crucified. And you're either going to follow it or you're going to reject it. You can give all sorts of reasons why you don't believe it, but at the end of the day, you believe it or you don't believe it. All of us today will fall on one side of the line or the other. There's no way of straddling the line. But Christmas, talk about a time of season where people want to straddle the line. You want to celebrate Christmas. You like everything about Christmas. But as soon as Christmas is over, you step right back over on that other side of the line. Where are you standing? Where are you today? What I do know is you're sitting here today. And you're hearing God's word and hopefully the spirit is stirring something in your heart and you're anticipating something great. Like there's something better than what you are doing right now in life. There's something better that you can experience in Jesus. And maybe today is your appointment with Jesus. Maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to say, look at him. He's more than a baby. He's more than a nativity scene that you put away. He is the savior of the world. The opposition and rejection experienced by Jesus would end in pain for Mary as well. Just briefly, we know that Simeon says, a sword will will pierce your own soul too. And in the Gospel of John, we see Mary standing before Jesus on the cross, and of course she's going through the, seeing the physical pain that her son is going through. But part of that pain may also be the fact of asking that question, have God's promises failed? How could this be the way to save people from their sins? How could this be the way to salvation? How could this bring any comfort? But then we're introduced to the second appointment that God had for them that day. And it was a woman named Anna. And she will announce something 
that we need to make sure we're hanging on to in our lives as well. So she's going to be giving us the announcement in verses 36 through 40. So we're going to finish off the chapter. Let's read it together. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. So we get a little bit more background about Anna, her lineage, the fact that she is a widow and well advanced in years. But what we find out also is that she too has a soft heart, devout in her ways and awaiting the promises of God. She doesn't speak, or I mean, we at least don't get her words here, but we can assume that the Holy Spirit has also led her to Jesus. And she knows now as she's with Simeon that this is the promised child. And she picks up the theme of redemption, which would draw her back to Isaiah 52, which says this, burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Comfort, redemption, in the sight of all nations, the salvation of our God. I mean, everything we've seen in this passage is right here in Isaiah 52. The Lord has comforted his people in sending Jesus the consolation. He's redeemed Jerusalem, setting them free. And this has all been done in the sight of all nations, like Simeon said. The ends of the earth will see the salvation of God that is now offered to Jews and to Gentiles. And so this leads to our second response. If this is true and we trust in Jesus, our second response must be to share this news with others. Because Isaiah 52, 9 says, burst into songs of joy together. And that's exactly what Anna's doing. It's exactly what Anna's doing. She gave thanks to God for the gift of this baby. She believed there was something different, that he was the redemption of Jerusalem. And what does it say? She went and told the people. Look at verse 38. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward. The same word, waiting. All who were waiting, looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So she's saying, are you, are you waiting for the Messiah? He's here. Are you waiting? So is this true of us? Are we taking this message? Because we have a lot more information than Anna does. We have a lot more. Like again, people are like, Anna, what are you talking about? Like it's just a baby. We're expecting a warrior with an army behind him. That's a baby over there. And we say, yeah, it's a baby who grew into a man, lived a perfect life, went to the cross on our behalf, rose from the dead, ascended to seat at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back. He's been victorious over sin and death. When we look at that, how are we not sharing that news? Beyond Christmas season, beyond Easter. We need to believe that this is important. Now, you know, I couldn't go an entire Christmas sermon without bringing up a Charlie Brown Christmas. <laughs> so, when Charles Schultz was putting that all together in 1965, and he said, I'm going to have Linus recite Luke 2, which has become iconic now, they said, you can't do that. It will be offensive. And that was in 1965. Imagine what would happen today. So Schultz responded by saying, look, if we aren't going to do this, or if we're going to do this, we should talk about what Christmas is all about, not just do a cartoon with no particular point of view. Not a cartoon with no particular point of view. If we're going to do this, let's tell people what Christmas is all about. Or else Christmas becomes something with no particular point of view. We just celebrate some time of the season where we gather with people and we give gifts and we get off work. And some people are content with that. But if this baby is who we find out he says he is, then we should respond the same way and say, no, we have a reason for this season. Charles Schultz went on to say, if we don't do it, who will? And that's our question. If we don't, if we don't go out, nobody else is going to tell anybody else this message except for those who believe it and know it and trust in him and have been changed by him. And so that leads to our third response. We wait in obedience and expectation. Remember that Joseph and Mary are committed followers of God 
not wavering in their commitment or obedience to him. And so our passage ends in 39 and 40 saying that they return to Nazareth. The salvation they knew their son was going to bring, they end up taking back to Nazareth for an up, uh, like an ordinary upbringing in an ordinary town with ordinary parents. Seems a little anticlimactic. Like why not leave Jesus in the temple like Samuel was to be trained and equipped to be the Messiah that they claim he is. We cannot overestimate the importance of Jesus living with faithful and obedient parents. Because remember, he was God-man. He needed to see that as he grew up. He needed to see faithful and obedient parents. So what happens then in the waiting? Because that's what we get here now. We get a lot of waiting. We'll see him when he's 12 in the temple, and again, not until he's 30-something years old. So what happens in the waiting? Jesus grows up, and God prepares him for ministry. Verse 40, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. So everybody leaves the scene continuing to wait. Most likely Simeon and Anna, and we know Joseph because we don't hear any more of Joseph in Jesus' later life after 12, um, will die before Jesus' public ministry starts. And Mary treasures everything we know in her heart, the things she hears and things she experiences of Jesus, And now Jesus grows up and compared to other children, he's growing in wisdom beyond them. He's increasing in measure beyond what other kids at his age are, but nobody can quite put their finger on it as we'll see next week. And yet everyone continues to wait, waiting for the time for his ministry to start. And the thing is, we're waiting too. We're waiting too. Not at his first coming, but we're waiting for him to return. Christmas is just the first part of the good news. The incarnation sets in motion the eternal plan before all eyes, before every nation, that God was going to do something. We cannot talk about the cross and the empty tomb without Christmas, and Christmas only has meaning with the cross and the empty tomb. And the gospel message doesn't end with Jesus' ascension to heaven. It culminates when Jesus will return and make all things right, when he'll call us home to see him face to face and experience his unhindered glory forever. We even talked about this morning in our catechism question. The waiting is hard, though. The waiting is hard. It's easy to become impatient, to become bitter, to search for satisfaction in other places. But if we keep our hearts soft to God, if we trust him, if we share with others, if we're obedient to his word, then why wouldn't we say, come Lord Jesus, awaiting his return? Now, we don't, unfortunately, have a little chocolate calendar to count down the days when this will happen but maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. What we do know is that every day then is not another day that goes by. It's another day, an opportunity for us to respond in faith, living in obedience to God and his word and experiencing the joy, the hope, the peace, the comfort that other people are putting away at this time. And we get to live in that each and every day. So we say there's something bigger than just a baby in a manger. What we don't want to have happen is between now and next Christmas for there to be no change in who we are. No change in how we approach Christmas. No change in how we approach Easter. Simeon and Anna, knowing the Messiah was there, were never going to be the same again. Joseph and Mary were never the same again. The disciples were never the same again. And for many of us who have trusted Christ our Savior, we know we look a lot different than 10 years ago. And hopefully we look a lot different 10 years from now than we do right now. But I would say that hopefully by This week, when we celebrate New Year's, we're a little bit different. So I want to wrap up. Since it is the New Year coming up, I won't see you again until 2020 by giving just a challenge to everyone that comes from our passage this morning. Because again, how you respond to Jesus matters. And the best place for that to happen is to come face to face to see the salvation that Simeon saw by opening God's word and taking Brandon's challenge to us as a church. And say, I want to know everything there is to know about him. Everything there is to know about him. And hey, you're not going to necessarily start in the Gospels. The chain plan goes all over. But if you want to pick up a Gospel and start reading that, just say, I don't know who Jesus is, do that. But what the great thing is about Luke, in Luke 24, he says that Jesus ends up going to the Old Testament saying, everything here is about me anyways. So there's always a way to find Jesus and to get to Jesus and understand what Jesus was doing and fulfilling no matter where you start. But the point is, is you cannot... You cannot come to next Christmas without spending that time with him and getting to know who he is. And then how as a church can we help you to prepare to meet Jesus? 
three things I would encourage you in 2020 to consider. One is to join a community group. We need to be talking through and responding to God's word, not just talking about it, responding to God's word. And the best place for that to happen is in a community of other Christians who will challenge you to apply this together. We're not meant to live the Christian life alone. So please get plugged in, talk to Brandon about it. But we want to move from being hearers of the word to doers of the word because we're hearers only. We're just going to celebrate Christmas as a season. We want to be doers of the word. The hope, the joy, the comfort, the peace that we experience at Christmas is there for us year round. The second thing is elective classes. Be sure to check out all the different classes we offer. We run different types of tracks, some with deep theological um, topics, some with in-depth Bible study, others with very practical things on living the Christian life. But this is the place you can come ask questions, say, what does Jesus actually, how do I respond? How does this change my life? And getting that knowledge to understand how we live, how we should live. And then third is our journey groups. If you want to be challenged, have those tough questions asked of you, that accountability, this would be the place to do that. If you want to be equipped to live on mission, this would be the place to do that too. So we could be like Anna, taking the message to those around us. But remember, the hope, the joy, the comfort, the peace, don't put it away. Live in it every single day. And the way we live in it is we trust in Jesus, we share him with others, and we obey his word. And in the waiting will come blessing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we come together because of what Christ has done in the incarnation, in his death, and his resurrection, making a way for us to be saved, making a way for us to be reconciled to you. And Lord, my prayer is that um, next Christmas we come back looking a lot more like you. A lot more like you. So we spend time in your words, we dig into who you are and what you said, what you did, and we ask you to change us and we respond to you with our whole lives. Lord, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.